Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us for our fall kickoff episode of Alumni Conversations. We're so excited to have you here and even more excited to be joined by Matt and Renee, both Tisch Institute for Global Sports alumni, and just can't wait to hear their conversation. I'd love to turn it over to Renee. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's alumni conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm Renee Rismondo. I'm joined by my former classmate and now my industry colleague, Matthew Gaeta of Gaeta Sports Management. Uh, both of us are very excited to speak with you all today and talk a little bit about our time at NYU, as well as the NYU School of Professional Studies, its resources, professors, mentors, and all who helped us establish our careers today, as well as talk about the Violet Network, which is SPS's global platform for alumni and students to connect, network, and mentor. So to begin, I will start by introducing myself and Matt, and then we will launch into our conversation. And feel free to send us questions in the chat box. I believe the chat might be disabled, but the Q&A will be live, and then we will be taking Q&A at the end. So to begin, I'm Renee Rosmondo. I am the Senior Coordinator of Player Operations at the Major League Baseball Players Association. Like many of you, I attended New York University and I was a graduate of the School of Professional Studies. I hold my degree in sports management from the Tisch Institute of Sports Management, Media and Business. In my role at the Players Association, I'm a part of the International and Domestic Player Operations Department. That department, we oversee international entry, international play, special and domestic events, all-star joint programs and initiatives with the league and the commissioner's office, player programs, as well as player communication. Some of my responsibilities include compliance of the collective bargaining agreement and within these areas, as well as overall engagement and education of players and the protection of player rights. And during my time at the Players Association, I've worked with players on events that you all may have heard of, such as the World Baseball Classic, the Japan Postseason Tour, the London Series, most recently the Field of Dreams. Um, I've worked with the U.S. State Department and the U.S. Embassy in Bogota, Colombia to provide assistance to Venezuelan refugees during the ongoing humanitarian crisis impacting players and their families and the communities while working to grow the game of baseball internationally as well as throughout South America and Colombia. Uh, a little bit about me during my time at NYU. I was the manager of the varsity baseball team as well as served as president of the class activities board. I was a member of the School of Professional Studies Undergraduate Student Council, the Student Senators Council, and I was a member of the inaugural Dean Scholars Program. So enough about me. Um, I'm going to introduce my friend, our other panelists, and somebody who I'm fortunate to work with in the industry, Matthew Gaeta. Um, a little bit about him. Matt is the CEO and MLBPA certified agent of Gata Sports Management. At age 21, he is one of the youngest individuals to ever pass the MLBPA agent certification exam. Today, he is the sole agent of over 80 professional baseball players, having negotiated contracts at the major, minor, and international levels. He was named to Sports Business Journal's 2020 tw New Voices Under 30, as well as most recently the 2021 Cranes New York Business 20 in their 20s. And he most notably secured a five-year guaranteed $9.25 million contract for his client and once undrafted free agent, Randy Domnack of the Minnesota Twins. Over the past few major league seasons, his clients have appeared on major league opening day rosters. They've completed, they've competed in the MLB playoffs, World Series, and they've earned prestigious individual accolades. He graduated from NYU in 2017, and he was a university honors scholar, earning NYU's Founders Day Award. And he was also a catcher on the NYU varsity baseball team, where he earned UAA Spring Sport All Academic and Intercollegiate Athletic Advisory Committee Spring Honor Roll Awards in 2014. He's currently a 3L Evening Division student and Dean Scholar at New York Law School. So welcome, Matt. Now that we've formally introduced ourselves and I talked a lot, let's begin. First so, uh, thank you, Renee. First off, thank you for that lengthy introduction. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that Renee is a true trailblazer for females aspiring to work in the sports industry. Uh, she's accomplished a ton in the PA's office, starting as an intern from our freshman year at NYU to 
handling monumental tasks at the PA's office now. Um, and she's been an absolute uh, gem to work with and unreal help to both me and my clients uh, as I navigate through the process of, of having major league clients. Um, and also full disclosure, she created the entire uh, itinerary for this panel discussion, questions and all. So um, I first wanted to say that. Uh, thank you for being such a great friend, colleague, um, and giving you your much deserved credit because uh, you set all of this up. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Matt. I appreciate it. Um, so I guess let's begin. When did you realize that you wanted to be an agent, specifically a baseball agent? And what really was the driving force to help you start your own agency? So probably since I was around 10 or 11 is when I wanted to be a sports agent growing up in the morning uh, before going to school. A lot of kids my age would watch MTV or TBS, Saved by the Bell, and those type of shows, Nickelodeon, Fresh Prince. And honestly, I just loved watching SportsCenter every morning. And at the bottom ticker, I would uh, notice player X signed for X amount of dollars per agent. And I looked at my dad one day, who's an engineer and has absolutely no clue about anything in sports. And... I said, hey, dad, how does a player get that contract? What, is he, what does he do to, to go through the process of securing that? And he basically just told me that players have representatives and that they're agents. And uh, I dove into more research of, of what an agent does and whatnot. And uh, that sort of really piqued my interest was seeing how the business side of things worked even at such a young age. And that was that sort of helped cultivate to where I am today. Um, in terms of baseball specifically, I played baseball throughout middle school, high school, college, um, and even growing up, played hockey, football, those sports. But uh, baseball was really the most knowledgeable, so to speak, um, for me personally, uh, knowing the business side of it, knowing the rules and regulations, um, and being able to relate with players is, is a big thing more than just understanding the CBA and whatnot. Um, I knew that if I was going to be an agent, I would be way more respected amongst my clients having had played the game and, and the terminology of being able to converse with them and relate with them after certain games. So, um, choosing baseball as the competitive route for me to focus as a sport growing up that kind of just situated itself to where I knew I wanted to be a baseball agent. Um, so, yeah. No, I, I mean, I completely agree. I think the relatability factor is something that is so underestimated. Uh, just knowing that these guys have a different schedule than most and knowing what they need and how to properly communicate to them and be effective. It's, it's really important. And I think a lot of people don't or underestimate that relatability factor. So I, I totally hear you on that. So next question, you started the agency Gata Sports Management while you were an undergrad at NYU. How did your NYU professors or your education that you received in your courses best prepare you and assist you during this process? Was there a specific professor that really made an impact on you during this time? Yeah, to be quite honest, Professor Myler and Professor Grantham, who's now at Seton Hall, uh, had a tremendous amount of impact um, on, on my career. Uh, sports law and antitrust and collective bargaining agreement were both classes that they both individually taught and I mean, Professor Myler for sports law, we would every day when reviewing cases, we would develop a fact pattern and assess and analyze certain situations. And to the state, when I'm assessing a player on whether he's a good fit for the agency or not, or even in contract negotiation for a major league or minor league free agent, um, I still utilize a lot of the components that were taught in that class. So definitely that. And like I said, Professor Charlie Grantham, um, every morning he would make us read current event articles that he would print out and he would always say knowledge is power. The more, you know, the 
better you're equipped in your toolbox to be able to converse with people and have at your disposal. So I still adhere to those words and I try to read at least two to three current event articles every morning when I wake up um, within the sports industry. And honestly, I could name a lot of other professors, Professor uh, Cooper, Professor DeLuca. Um, honestly, all of them were just very open, understanding and encouraging. They never belittled any of my ideas. Um, their doors were always open for office hours, which um, was definitely a huge help for me to just to hear their perspectives because I mean, all of them were, they've made it. ESPN, uh, Olympians, NBA PA, um, they all have made it to where I wanted to. So being a sponge and what Professor DeLuca said, being a sponge and absorbing as much knowledge as possible. Um, all the professors were a huge, huge impact on, on my career and uh, even more so outside of the class, which is why I loved SBS was because all the professors had office hours. They were open. Um, and if you did your due diligence and, and made time and, and put in the work, they were willing to help guide you. So, yeah. No, I mean, I, I completely agree. I think it's hard for us to pick one, but exactly. if I had to pick one, oh, that's tough. I think for me, it might have to be Professor Hollander. I had him literally day one of my intro to sports management. He was day one college career, first class I ever took intro to sports management. And I'm never going to forget his first lesson in that program. And it was that you have to separate your fandom if you wanted to have a seat at the table and work in sports business. And it's funny and ironic because he actually is like known as a bit of more of a marketing professor at NYU based on like teaching consumer behavior and his experiential uh, learning real world courses, which I will absolutely take a second to plug for any current students on here. Be sure to sign up for, I took three, can't recommend them enough. Um, and a lot of those classes were a lot more marketing based and anyone who knows me knows I work more in baseball ops. Um, social media marketing, not really my strong points, but in those classes, I actually think I learned the most from the professional skills of how to communicate with executives, how to pitch clients, um, and even just important, but basic skills like project management and collaboration. Those are skills and abilities that are not just used, but actually required daily, every single day in this industry. But I, I regret I never had uh, Professor Grantham like you did. Um, when I when it was my turn, I had Professor Khan for antitrust and collective bargaining. And I do have to give a shout out to him. I distinctly remember I was the only female in that class. Um, and so I think he liked to push me and challenge me because he knew how badly I wanted it and how much I was engaged on this subject. So when he knew I had a passion for working with players on the labor side and it lined up with my internships and now my current real world experience. So when we actually teamed up to bargain in our class, he pushed me outside my comfort zone and sat me on the management side um, because he taught me that I always need to look at a negotiation from both perspectives. And it's crazy to think about that from like a class perspective, but a lot of what I learned there is so relevant from both the material and subject matter standpoint, but also from a real life application standpoint that I use a lot of that today in my daily role. So I think both of us have a lot of professors that we can spend a lot of time thanking. <laughs> oh, the list, the list goes on. I never had Hollander. I feel like I'm the only person in this program that never took him. Oh my goodness, you are- I know missing out. I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> any any student on the line, please, 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 please go out of your way to take a Hollander class. I think I think your life might be changed. Um, so back to you, Matt. Obviously, working and thinking outside the box by starting an agency as an undergrad, uh, sometimes thinking outside the box creates a lot of extra attention, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. So what did you tell yourself along the way when you were dealing with all of those classmates or peers who really thought that you and your agency were going to fail? You want the PG answer or the rated R answer? <laughs> Maybe let's do a PG-13. All right. 
Uh, no, honestly, I tell my players this too. And this is a sentiment that um, I made once I opened the agency. And honestly, that I've been living throughout the rest of my life with, which is no matter how difficult times get throughout your life, always remember your why, your reason and purpose for why you do what you do. Um, unfortunately, especially in this industry, any industry, professional sports, as I tell my players, um, you're going to have people that are going to doubt you, that are going to truthfully want to see you fail. Um, and ultimately, you're going to. That's just, that's the reality of life. You're going to fail. And um, it's not about, um, you know, failing itself. It's how you respond to it. And I think when you hold on to your why and you have a deep desired passion for what you're doing and you can recenter yourself during times where you fall flat on your face and say, all right, you know what? I failed. A lot of people want to see me fail. And you know what? I'm doing this because of X, Y, and Z. And I really don't care what anybody else has to say because I hold on to my purpose, my reason, my why I do what I do. Um, and that's what I tell myself. And that's what I tell my players, um, especially in a day and age where fans get a little too comfortable thinking that uh, athletes are entertainers and not humans. And I've heard some really, really crass things. And I, I tell the guys, I just say, what's your purpose? Why do you do what you do? So person A and person B in the stands, they don't matter. All that matters is why you're playing this game, who you're playing it for, your family. That's what matters, not any other outside noise. Way easier said than done, by the way. But recentering yourself and understanding why you do what you do, that got me through all the, the naysayers. So. No, I mean, I think especially in a day with social media, I see it from the other side, how much those guys get abused. And I think that's incredible advice for everybody. So take note. <laughs> so you and I work together a lot. We work together quite often now as our professional paths cross fairly regularly. You be Don't you just person. love me, by the way? Don't you just love our interactions? <laughs> yeah. You can't we get rid of me. We work together often, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> with you representing players and I work for the union and we can get to our professional roles later in the panel, but going back to NYU, what's your memory of how we met or the first time that our paths actually crossed as classmates? So I honestly, I think it was during baseball season and obviously because I was always hurt. That's no secret. Um, I was coming off elbow surgery and I think we crossed paths in the dugout and you just introduce yourself. I introduced myself and then we went our separate ways and I went back to the rehab facility um, because none of my body parts were working correctly. And then ultimately once I hung it up, I think we, we crossed paths in Professor Lasanti's class. And that's sort of where I think our dialogue really developed and we started talking about our similar career interests and paths and whatnot, but pretty sure it was during baseball season. And then once we got into sports management classes was, was when we started, you know, further talking, but what about you? What was your first memory of me? Oh, geez. Yeah. I mean, I think with the baseball program, we both like knew each other, but it was after you had to kind of hung it up. Our, our past didn't really cross that side of things, but I think for me, it would be, uh, that licensing and merchandising class with Professor Lasanti. Um, again, I like was familiar with you to an extent, but like through NYU athletics and the baseball program, but like we never really had like an official dialogue. Probably I told you at some point to like go pick up the net or pick up racks and balls or something for the coach. But <laughs> other than that, I don't think we had ever a meaningful dialogue. Um, but I think in that class, it was a night class. One day you just came up to me randomly. I was sitting there. And you said, hi, I'm Matthew Gaeta. And I think like in that moment, it was when we both realized like, okay, we both have similar aspirations of working in baseball. And you, I think at that point already started the groundwork for GSM and signing clients from your dorm room. Um, I think we both knew in the back of our minds that we were gonna be working together or our paths were gonna be crossing a lot one day. So I guess you never know who you're going to sit next to in class and how much of an no. impact 
they play on you in your personal and professional life. Yeah, I mean, we'll get into this later, but I knew truthfully where you were at and I knew ultimately you were going to rise to the level that you're at right now. And um, connection building is huge. Always just be nice to people because you really genuinely don't know where people are going to end up. Um, If I didn't hold the door open for Renee or introduce myself and I called five years later and say, hey, so I need help on this, uh, she would probably send me right to voicemail. Um, but it's just also about being a good person, not just for the perks of having someone higher up and a connection. But uh, yeah, I totally agree. You never know who you're going to be working with in the future. It's funny how things always work out. <laughs> yeah. So going back to NYU, what was your favorite course, professor, memory, just anything that you want to share about your time here at the School of Professional Studies? My most memorable one, honestly, was probably meeting Sonny Vaccaro. Um, I think it was 2016. It was an after school special that uh, the 70s 12th Street building. And for uh, context, Sonny Vaccaro was like this big sports, former sports marketing guy. Uh, he signed Michael Jordan to his first sneaker deal, um, developed a amateur high school basketball tournament that honestly was comparable to the McDonald's All-American game back uh, back in the day. And um, I walked up to him after he gave his talk about how he started and, and how he grew ultimately into the quote unquote shoe guy. And I said, hey, um, I'm going to be opening up a baseball agency next semester. I'm a junior here at NYU. Um, if you had one piece of advice for me, what would it be? And he grabbed me by the shoulder and he looked at me and he goes, son, God bless. Um, and just laughed at me. And then he said, no, seriously. He said, um, connect, connect, connect. He said those words three times and he said, make as many connections as possible. Um, having access to key figures within the industry will make you a more enticing option for representation uh, purposes when when clients are, are looking to sign with you um, and he just said connections this is the biggest thing that was my biggest takeaway from him um, and he's not wrong um, I mean having having signed 20 guys to free agent deals this off season if I didn't make connections throughout my five years of being an agent with certain front office personnel that doesn't happen um, you're only you could have all the degrees in the world. You could have the highest IQ. If you're not personable, if you're not outgoing, if you're not willing to uh, make connections with individuals within the industry, you're not honestly going to go very far. And that was something that I took to heart because when you go through school, it's ultimately, I need straight A's, I need straight A's and this and that. It's like, actually, you need the human component of it as well, which is to be able to converse, to be a nice person because that really does go a long way, not fake, and uh, making connections and, and putting yourself out there. So I personally would say meeting Sonny was was definitely groundbreaking for me, and I take his advice to heart. I think people don't realize how small the industry really is. It's um, incredibly small. Yeah, like it's a you could throw a stone and hit, 10 people who know 10 people who, okay, will recommend you here, reference you here. And I think it's a really common um, misconception. Uh, So, I mean, look how agent Brody Van Wagenen then became GM and is now back at another agency. And then it's, it's just crazy. The networking is, is just truly it's, it's people don't like, again, they underestimate how small the industry really is. Um, and having a good name for yourself is important because once you have a bad name, it's, it's a small industry. It's hard to get rid of that. Yeah. Don't want that. So final question on this topic before we move on to our present day careers and working in baseball. Uh, what is the best advice that you would like to give NYU students now based on what you learned from your personal experiences or professional experiences? This could be career related uh, personal and professional, what would you say aside from making connections? <laughs> yeah. Aside from making, uh, connections and holding on to your why I'd say stay true to yourself, your values and what makes you, you, because 
like I said earlier in the panel, you're going to fail. You are going to fall flat on your face when attempting to do certain things in life, in business, whatever it may be. And there's going to be temptation to say, oh, I want to do what person A is doing over there because they're having success with that. Or I could be the next Brody or next Scott Boris and he's doing that. No, you have to stay true to yourself and what makes you you because honestly, you were you were made to be unique and everybody has unique talents that others don't have. And that's something that is very beneficial to offer to companies. And I think when you stay within yourself and trust yourself and, and trust the values that you were brought up on and staying true to your vision um, and don't deviate and try to hit a quick eject button to say, oh, I'm just going to do this because that person had success and, and they did it. Um, that's, that's my biggest piece of advice is really stay true to yourself and what you believe in and no matter how hard you fall or how high you soar, really stay true to yourself. And that really goes uh, to ring home for success as well, because I've seen success change a lot of people too. And you really have to remember the people who are in your corner from day one. So staying true to yourself is probably my biggest takeaway. Nice. No, I, I think that's very valuable. And I agree. I think for me, it would be to try new things. And this could be about your professional life, but it could be about your personal life as well. Um, I mean, <laughs> I give this example so often, but it's ironic, but it's, it's true. I came from a small town in Pennsylvania and I didn't, I never tried sushi. Um, and I never really traveled anywhere outside of the US or like the Caribbean. And I came to NYU thinking I didn't like sushi. I never had it just had this formulated opinion in my head. And finally I met some friends and they were like, you gotta try it, you gotta. It. Turns out I love sushi. I love pretty much any food now, but I was so close-minded and I wasn't willing to try it. And I think that really translates whether your personal life and your food choices, but I think it translates into your professional life as well. Um, it gives you, when you try new things and experience new things, whether it's new cultures or meet new people or travel to new cities, I think it gives you a broader perspective and a more educated understanding and opinion on things. Uh, and it makes you a better person in the long run. And then translating that to my professional life, my first internship was a communications PR internship. Anybody who knows me knows my social media is lame. I lose followers. I'm not that exciting. Um, but I did it and I learned. Sometimes there's value in learning uh, that an internship isn't always what you like, but there's value in learning what you don't like either. So you don't spend your time on it or you don't waste time because time is value and it's money. So I think there's a lot of value to try new things, but in that experience, while I may not have been the communications PR person that I once thought I could be, I networked and met a lot of great people in the industry and got my foot in the door and to where I am now in baseball. So I think try new things, whether it's sushi or an internship. <laughs> um, no, I, I agree. So I think we have one more topic that we're going to go over. And I saw that a couple of you guys are starting to put questions in the Q&A. Uh, we will be doing Q&A at the end. So keep flooding those questions in. Um, but let's move on to like working in baseball now, especially specifically what you do as an agent. Taking all of what you've talked about here, um, you represent over 80 players across various leagues. That's a lot. Thinking about the classic movie that I think everybody's seen, Jerry Maguire, uh, how do you find balance to care for each client? And how do you have a meaningful relationship with each player? To be honest, each player is, is different. Um, when I sign them, whether I reach out to them or via word of mouth, they find me. Um, I make it a point, first and foremost, to tell them, listen, I'm not a normal agent. I'm very hands-on, very, and yeah, you, you can tell from my social media, definitely not a normal agent. Um, very hands-on, very family-oriented, uh, whether it's a wife, girlfriend, cousin, brother, sister, mom, dad. Um, if they've been a part of the player's journey way before I stepped into the picture, so I say straight from the get-go, you want them in on the process, here's my number, 
and we can talk and we could have constant communication. Um, but each player is honestly different. My selling point really is I'm going to be there for you guys from a business standpoint, but also more as a family and a friend than sort of a person to, to lean on during tough times. And um, if ultimately the player wants to talk with me on a daily basis, that's totally fine. There are players that literally call me every single day or I call because we've developed that relationship where I know that player needs that. Great. There are some that I literally talk to their brother and their dad way more than the player because the player's just like, I'm just going to go out and do my thing. You take care of the business side and you can just deal with my family. Um, so honestly, I don't find the number 80 or even 90 a burden. Um, it's just about being able to adapt and adjust to what the player's needs are because certain players do need that constant communication. Others don't. They just need someone to trust that they feel comfortable with that's going to do the job and to check in on them once in a while, but ultimately um, just understanding their wants and their needs and then sort of adjusting accordingly. Again, relatability is so key. You stressed that earlier and I stress again now. So yeah. I think both of us know the value and honor, but also hard work to work with professional athletes. And there's a lot of trials and tribulations that come with that. What's one of the best lessons that you learned from working with players or that one of your clients taught you? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get emotional, but uh, one of the first clients that I ever signed, uh, Chase Umada, who played for the Detroit Tigers, Philadelphia Phillies, and New York Yankees organization, uh, tragically passed away in 2019, uh, was one of the first guys that I signed out of my dorm room. And he would always tell me, be the reason someone smiles today. And he'd honestly always say that to me whenever I saw him or whenever I talked to him on the phone, be the reason someone smiles today. Whether that's saying good morning to them, holding the door open for a random stranger, just doing nice things go a long way just to make the world uh, a better place. And, and I do tell my players that every time you go to a stadium or every time you go even if you're just going for breakfast or lunch or dinner, hold the door open for someone, say, say, how's your day going? You don't know what that person's going through in a given day. And you could be the reason that a person smiles. And I definitely feel compelled to tell this story because uh, it's really awesome. And I didn't find out until this year, but the night that uh, Chase passed, uh, he didn't catch that night game, but he went inside to the trainer's room and was getting work done because he's a catcher or he was a catcher and he just needed to get work done. And as he was running into the dugout after the game, a fan said, Hey, can you, can you sign my ball? And Chase said, I'll be out in like 15 minutes. I'm just grabbing something like stay in and I'll sign a ball. Well, he ended up staying an hour and a half later than anticipated. And the kid actually stayed the entire hour and a half at the stadium. The stadium lights were still on. And Chase came back outside, seeing the kid was still there. And he gave him a signed bat, say, gave him signed batting gloves. And he said, hey, come onto the field with me. And he threw a baseball with a random fan for 15 or 20 minutes the night before he passed, or the night that he passed. And that, that honestly is, is a story that I just found out this year from, from a fan who, who witnessed it. And uh, definitely rings true to the testament of, be the reason someone smiles today because that fan will never forget it. Um, I came in contact with the fan and that, that kid's a huge Chase Numata fan. And um, anybody watching, I definitely encourage you to Google Chase Numata because every article that you read about him, every post that you see about him on social media, uh, he's the ultimate role model of a human and professional athlete. Um, and he's honestly a very big reason why I am where I'm at because um, he, he always believed in me and uh, just a self, selfless, selfless individual and um, be the reason someone smiles today. That's, that's my biggest takeaway. What about you? I love that. And I think something that a lot of people don't realize is that players are humans too. Athletes are humans and they have hearts and they have families and they are good people. And I think um, 
for me, some of the best lessons I've learned is when I've had the opportunity to travel and see some of their hometowns in the Dominican Republic and Colombia and Mexico and all these different places where they truly came from nothing. And I think sometimes we don't uh, always see, believe it until we see it, but um, you can learn so much by seeing someone else's environment and community and being exposed to what is truly important to them and seeing how baseball and family and all these things are so important to them that I think for me, just learning and uh, getting culture and opportunities from them and their communities and the places that they call home and the people that they call family. So last question before we open up the Q&A. I think a lot of people on the Zoom, you guys have been asking really awesome questions so far. They are eager to hear about your recent deal that you negotiated with Minnesota Twins pitcher, Randy Dobnak. Uh, can you give a little bit of detail, like a Reader's Digest version? Uh, how did that all transpire? Like what was the deciding factor that ultimately came to make this agreement happen? Um, honestly, aside from the basics of evaluating Randy's metrics and statistics to comparable players and, and what they earned and, and finding um, in the financial midpoint of, of what he would be offered, um, it really just came down to what the player wants. And that's what I ultimately uh, harp on with my agency when I sign guys. I will do whatever the player wants. I'll provide pros and cons to each situation, um, my professional opinion, my professional advice, but ultimately um, I treat them like adults. This is, this is your career and I will, I will guide you the best that I can, but I will never make a decision for you because I don't think anybody in life should. And it was something that Randy didn't come from a lot. Randy was a Uber driver or a Lyft. Let me plug that in because of our, recent uh, endorsement deal um, and undrafted free agent who threw maybe 91, 92 and was an unheralded prospect who was, it's not supposed to be here. And when I signed him, when he came out of semi pro ball into the twins, he always joked with me and said, if I get an extension, I'm, I'm taking it. Um, whatever it may be. And all jokes aside of like, 10 years for one mil and just like joking like that. But um, Randy honestly took the league by storm and, and he pitched well in a very, very limited amount of appearances. Doesn't have that much of a track record. And again, connections I have a close relationship with the twins front office. And it was something where Randy was catching fire. And ultimately he always wanted financial security for his family. Always wanted that. Um, and I put his needs above all else's because ultimately um, there are going to be situations where maybe a player is being viewed as less from the front office for a team friendly deal. Or maybe you take the risk and say, I can play better and in two or three years after make 10 times more than that. Um, and that's that's ultimately what. I present to the player. I say, if you pass up this, this is how much you could be losing. If you take this, this is how much financial security you could have. And then if we put options and escalators and incentives, we can max it out to this and just laid out for him. Best case scenario here, worst case scenario here. Ultimately, what do you want to do with this? And that was the process of what do you, your wife and your family want? Um, and then after he told me what he wanted, um, I made it happen for him. And that's really the gist of it without getting too technical is, um, providing the service for your client that he or she wants. Um, and again, you list out the pros and cons, you make them aware of, if you walk away, this is what could happen. Could be good. Could be bad. If you take it and if you play well, this is how much you could honestly be worth, but. Randy came down to the decision of financial security for me and my family. This is how we want to live and get us a deal around this, you know, monetary frame. And it worked. And it was, uh, again, a testament to the business model on my end of um, 
I do what the players want from me um, and just educate them on the process. But they're adults and, and they make decisions because it's their life. Baseball is only five to 10 years, maybe 12 plus if you're lucky. Flat. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> as I said that, I'm going to retract that statement. Um, if you're lucky if it's even five years. Um, but they have to live with those decisions for the rest of their lives. And uh, without getting too technical, baseball contracts are a year to year. You could be non-tendered. You could get designated for assignment. There is no guarantees unless you get a guaranteed contract. Um, you could get hurt. You could perform very poorly and be passed up. Um, so those are all factors that cancels your team and your season. Exactly. Um, and that's, that's, that's pretty much it with Randy was, and just advice going forward is I, uh, you work for your client. You don't put aside personal agendas, put aside what other people in the industry may think. Um, the individual that's signed with you specifically as an agent, they're trusting you. I have a fiduciary duty to act, uh, in my client's best interest for them, not myself, not a system's interest and not anybody else's interest. It's the person who put pen to paper that said, you are my rep. I want you to rep me. Um, so, yeah. No. And I think for those on the line who aren't familiar with the full details of that recent agreement, I think you guarantee you got Randy guaranteed a little bit over 9 million. And then I think with all the escalators built in and it actually can be upwards of like 45, $50 million. So that's incredible. And kudos to you, Matt. Thanks Renee. <laughs> so, all right. I think before we head on to our Q and a, we'll take the last 15 minutes to uh, 15, 20 minutes to answer all these awesome questions that are coming in. I just want to take one brief opportunity to encourage everybody on this call. If you're not already to join the violet network, uh, there are over 39,000 alumni uh, from NYU on the Violet Network, and they are located around the world here in New York and anywhere you call home. And it's an opportunity for students to connect on career insights, networking opportunities, and participating in mentorship relationships. So um, if you're enjoying this dialogue, you can reach out to both Matt and myself on there. I highly encourage you to check it out. Um, all right, let's open up this Q&A because you guys are really asking awesome questions. So Matt, what is the most challenging thing that you have experienced as an agent? And with that, what's been the most rewarding? Uh, most challenging has definitely been overcoming the age misconception of your young and experience and um, that narrative. And, and ultimately, as I tell players, if you have the connections in the industry, if you have the knowledge of the basic agreement and you understand how the business side of things work, um, it doesn't matter if you're 60 or 20, um, if you have the work ethic, if you have the drive, if you have the passion and you're willing to put in the work and have those connections and can be strategically efficient, you can make it work. Will it take a little bit of time? Sure. But ultimately, again, if you stay true to your roots and, uh, you develop a clientele roster of good individuals that, that trust you and put their trust, um, in you that you can make it work. So for anybody who thinks, oh, I might be too young to do this. Um, honestly, I'm kind of living proof that that narrative really doesn't hold up. And same with Renee, with where she is. Um, if, if, you, if you can capitalize on certain moments and build momentum and uh, just be a good person, it comes back to being a good person and, and being trustworthy and relatable um, good things can happen. Um, most rewarding. Uh, I mean, seeing guys make their big league debuts um, and being with their families, seeing guys even go to just big league camp or even a minor league uh, free agent signing. Um, that's what it's all about. Uh, getting those calls saying, I'm going up to AAA or, Hey, I'm going to the show or even with guys in the playoffs and like, uh, Nick, one of my clients, Nick Anderson, going to the World Series, sharing that moment with him, knowing that we started eating Domino's pizza at the Holiday Inn in, in 2017 and sharing those bonds with those guys. That's that's what it's about. It's really about the journey. And that's what 
is so rewarding because it's that underdog chip on your shoulder mentality that a lot of people are going to doubt you and they're going to say certain things, but you stay, you stay true to who you are and you stay true as a unit, as a family, and you can, you can inspire a lot of people. And that's, that's the most rewarding part. So we got a fun question while you were answering that. And in less than a minute, tell me how, what, being younger, what do you wear? Which I know you love to talk about with all your suits to come off as professional, but not stuffy. So less than a minute, so, I want to hear this one. <laughs> less than a minute. I, I mean, I used to wear suits, but then honestly, I got the hint that that was way too over and above. Um, I don't know, I so I just wear... time in that I would see Matt walking around a major league stadium in a full blown suit dress shoes. <laughs> yeah. So just yeah, that's right. Just envision that one. <laughs> yeah. No, and then honestly, I just started wearing khakis and just sort of like dress comfortable sneaker dress shoes and a polo, um, casual, like going to a golf course, I, even I, like this. Yeah, I agree. No tie, um, just sport jacket. I think uh, all I can say on that topic is that your image does matter. And I think everybody represents themselves differently. But at the end of the day, how you represent and express yourself is very important and valuable. But know that other people are watching and taking into consideration. And um crazy to think about, but it's important. And take that into mind on your social media, in your personal life, in your professional life, et cetera. So I like this question. What is the process of becoming a certified agent? Uh, so honestly, how I started, I was in class and I sort of just veered off. And when I wanted to become an agent, I built a business plan filed for an LLC and then ultimately went on to the MLBPA's site and uh, registered for a background check. And once I passed the background check, you take a written exam that consists of the basic agreement, joint drug prevention treatment program and the MLBPA uh, rules governing player agents. And it's a 50 question test. And then once you pass that, uh, the last remaining factor is having uh, a 40 man major league baseball rostered player uh, designate you as his player agent. Um, so the process is quite lengthy, but once it, once you get into the swing of things, it's, it's fine. But yeah, I'd say it was business plan, LLC, background check test, and then uh, big leaguer. Right. And business plan and LLC are only if you are creating your own entity. Exactly. Uh, if you get a job with, Boris Corp or CAA, they will have all that taken care of for you. You just have to go through the exam, which I can tell you from the MLBPA side, it is quite lengthy. It's 50 questions on the collective bargaining agreement, joint drug agreement, major league rules, everything Matt discussed. And believe it or not, it is open book, which a lot of people don't know. But working sometimes is not about what you know, because not everybody knows the answer to everything but how you find information. And I think Matt going to law school currently, cause that is a huge factor in part of becoming an agent as well. A lot of athletes, I think you notice, look for more legal representation, um, being able to find information and read it and understand it. Would you say that's quite applicable? Oh, hundred percent for major, for MLB specifically too, you don't need I don't know if the rules change. You don't need an undergrad degree or a JD for MBA and NFL. I'm, I'm almost positive you need either a graduate degree or like three or four years post undergrad of, of contract negotiation skills. Um, but yeah, anything that you could do to provide credibility to yourself, whether that's a graduate program or law school can definitely help. Um, it's not required, but I mean, the skills that I've learned in law school, honestly, have helped me. It's, it's made me uh, view things in, in different lights. It's made me think differently. Um, and it's just challenged my way of thinking, which ultimately, again, these players are hiring you as a representative to, you know, think on their 
best behalf and and think of all possible avenues and knowledge is power and that's just that's one way yeah and i think um while not required at least in baseball it is highly 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 recommended that you do go to law school or uh, practice law to represent a client if you're going to do contract negotiations for example marketing uh, negotiations are a little bit different and there's different levels of agency. You could be a general certified or a limited certified. Matt is general. Um, but I, for those asking in the chat, you don't have to, but highly recommend it with the money that is in the sports industry now, uh, and the money that you're dealing with gone are the days of hiring a father, a brother, a cousin, a whole family to run a shop for you. Um, we take that very seriously into consideration when agents are applying for certification, um, that this isn't just a hobby. This is actually a, a real career that they are going to represent the best interests of players. Um, so a couple more questions here. Let's see. Are there any books on negotiations that you would recommend, or if not, any specific advice uh, to take into on negotiations? There was, well, I would definitely recommend first and foremost, uh, registering or subscribing to Sports Business Journal. I definitely think um, in terms of contracts and negotiations, there's a lot of content in terms of whether it's basketball, baseball, football, soccer, hockey. Um, there's a lot of content that dives into the nitty gritty of what a player is getting and, and how it's negotiated and, and that process. So I definitely say uh, Sports Business Journal, and I know a lot of our professors at NYU hammered that home. Um, I think you get a student discount, but I'm a subscriber of that. And um, I mean, utilizing just Google, just Googling sports contracts and just reading, reading obviously credible articles, not on blogs, but um, through newspaper articles or any of that is, is really helpful. I don't have a textbook or a book per se. Um, I just really absorbed a lot of just practical and industry related knowledge of just seeing, oh, player X got this deal and his agent had this relationship with this front office personnel and just connecting the dots and going a little bit the extra mile and getting a pamphlet that says you need to do A, B, C, D. Um, so yeah. No, I agree. I think um, there's so many textbooks that our professors at NYU would recommend in the best uh, interest in the business of baseball and the game and all those that are very, from a, outsider perspective on how other negotiations were done, but I would say personally my favorite book that I've ever read specifically about negotiations has nothing to do with baseball. It's called Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as if Your Life Depended on It, and it was written by Chris Voss, who's a Navy SEAL, and he talked about some very high hostage situations or different negotiations, and it's actually crazy, but those approaches that he essentially puts in his book uh, people use for salary increases, for title changes, for real world conversations. So not just like Matt negotiating a player's contract, but negotiating and valuing your own worth in your industry as well. And so I highly recommend Never Split the Difference for anybody who's looking for a good book on negotiations. Um, all right, let's see a couple more questions. Matt, how did you begin to build a client base when you had less experience than other agents that had players, but they chose to sign with you? Um, I mean, I honestly just sold them on the fact that I, if you sign with me, I'm going to be able to be there from you from, from a human element standpoint, because as I said, it anybody can sit down and memorize and understand the collective bargaining agreement, the joint drug prevention treatment program. Um, and anybody can do that. Uh, it takes a very unique or special person. And this goes back to, you know, your core values as a person to really stay true to yourself of, Hey, I understand the business side of things. And ultimately I'm going to be able to go to bat for you and do certain things that you want me to do. 
but the trust factor is a huge component getting them to ultimately trust me and being genuine checking in on them calling them sending them text messages posting on my instagram stories of their games regardless if they're in rookie ball or they're pitching game six of the world series um it's it's that trust factor and loyalty that ultimately builds your brand and word of mouth that okay th this this guy is for real he's not just in it for the quick buck and looking for the next big prospect he genuinely cares about the person over the player and that's what i tell the guys i'm signing you as a person first then a player because realistically not everybody makes it to the major leagues i have 80 clients nine of them are in the major leagues like it just it happens but i've had guys who've retired who've never stepped foot on a major league field that i mean i'm blessed enough to call family and friends and facetime with them and their kids and be called uncle agent matt and uh that's that's how i built gsm is just being what my parents raised me which was just staying true to my values what is uh, an internship or job or something that helped propel you get to where you are today? And how did you get your foot in the door? I'll start on this one because I took the more traditional route. We yeah, have two very say, different, we have two very different approaches on this call. I took the traditional route. I did the internships. I, I then you, you, uh, went and started your own agency and foundation. So we'll talk about that next. But for me, I think, um, actually I got my foot in the door. I first started my first baseball experience was working with the NYU baseball team. I applied for a position within NYU athletics. The first year, my freshman year was the first year that NYU had a varsity baseball program. Um, in 2014, it was coming back after I think a 40 plus year hiatus. They were not a D three program. They were not officially part of the NCAA. I took a position with N uh, NYU Athletics um, with the goal and essentially becoming the statistician for both baseball and softball teams. And I, doing that, I kept pushing uh, the baseball manager to, or the, I'm sorry, the baseball coach to let me be the manager of the team. And I have to say, I'm very thankful for him because he didn't uh, he took a while to make a decision, which drove me crazy um, because he wanted to make sure that I was really in it for the right reasons and I really loved the game. I wasn't there just to be there. Um, and he didn't just treat me like a manager who's, okay, make sure the laundry's done, hang the schedule, help guys with this. He literally would let me hit fungos during BP, call BP, like help with different... Um, roster creations. So I think it really gave me a great exposure. And then from there, I had gotten my first internship with the MLBPA. They were uh, hired, they posted an internship position, they're hiring, I was fortunate to get it. And then from there, I networked uh, within the door. But I think the value I got from the NYU Athletic Sports Information Department and working with the NYU baseball team, it really gave me a foundational knowledge to help get myself to where I am now. And those are great on-campus job acti activities and opportunities as well. No, for sure. Um, yeah, I'm gonna leave that question up to you because mine's, I don't know, I just, yeah. You were you best- Formally, that your internship was essentially GSM, correct? Yeah, pretty much. Wow. I, yeah. No, it was all self-taught. I just went to the library and really just, I just immersed myself in a lot of books. And um, honestly, the best way to learn is by experience and would have having an internship been advantageous? Yes, but I learned as I went. So it's not common to open up your own business, but if you do, you'll, you'll learn along the way. So we have two more questions um, I, we're, cause we're hitting, we're a little bit over one o'clock now. So we'll try and wrap it up. Yeah. But um, was there, when did you officially realize that like your degree in sports management, it was like worth it, it paid off. And were there any other classes or minors that you took to during your time at NYU to kind of um, enhance that and your credibility in the industry? Yeah, I'd say the sports law concentration was definitely huge. That sort of catapulted me into 
wanting to definitely go the law route for, for night school, for law school. Um, in terms of, I guess, the school itself, um, the professors had more of an impact on me than the actual uh, content of, of the books. Um, again, it's a practical industry relatable uh, program. And that's what I loved about it. They didn't shove textbooks down your throat. They didn't say, write me an essay. It was dialogue. It was having interactive conversations in class. It wasn't PowerPoint slides. It was attacking real world and real life situations that were happening in the moment. And if you were a sports leader, how would you assess the situation? How would you do A, B, and C differently than what leader A did? Um, and it was the way that the professors um, sort of just transmitted the information that made me feel this was the most beneficial route because it was an industry that I wanted to go in, but also was taught in a manner that is applicable to everyday life. Because as you know, Renee, uh, you don't work, in, we don't work in an industry where we get PowerPoint presentations. It's, uh, it's, it's very on the go. And I think they prepared us well for that. Yes, baseball is not a nine to five for anybody yeah. who thought so. You're in for a rude awakening. You got a lot of nights and weekends ahead of you. <laughs> and a lot. So, yeah. I think just echoing all your sentiments, uh, having a more of a discussion style classroom, being with one professor to a 10 to 20 student ratio was huge because you really got to learn and engage and you're learning from industry professionals, not somebody who's trying to complete a thesis and essentially make you help research, research it. I learned a lot more from my sports classes and remember a lot more than I ever did from any texts and ideas or cultures and concepts context class um they being in a lecture hall with 300 plus people for me just was not an effective way to truly learn and it wasn't what I was passionate about and it's not something currently that uh, we really do in the industry it's a lot more collaboration and one-on-one -on -one learning and picking each other's brain but if you're looking for a specific minor um I had done two I started but it did not finish because I actually was trying to graduate early. Um, so Spanish language, I highly recommend. I had a little bit of a base. I spoke Italian growing up in my household. Um, so speaking language or speaking a language, especially Spanish or a, for example, Korean, Japanese, if you want to work in baseball, truly is an asset that sets you apart. Um, use Spanish daily, especially with the high Latin membership in baseball. And then I think one just for anybody that's a really valuable minor at NYU, especially for those looking to work in the sports industry, is BEMT, Business Entertainment Media and Technology. Um, even if you don't complete the minor, there's a ton of incredible classes that Stern offers through that. And I think it's a good way to immerse yourself within Stern, Steinhardt, and other programs as well. So our last question, uh, Matt, and I kind of was saving this one for last because I had to think about this one. It was interesting. What is your morning routine? Like, what do you do to get yourself in the zone? Maybe you're not a morning person, but just in general in life, what is like you have a big negotiation coming up. You need to go sign a client. Uh, you have to go meet with, I don't know, pretend player X got in trouble and you have to go have a meeting with the union or the league for something. What do you, what do, you do just to tell yourself to get ready and get in the zone? Everything just happens so fast that I just do it. Um, I try to honestly for, I mean, I mean, I think getting into a routine can help, but one thing that I've definitely learned in this industry, everything is completely not routine. Everything is at the drop of a hat. You need to be somewhere. Um, so honestly, adjusting and adapting to not having a routine and not having a schedule is probably beneficial. But things that I really do try to do every day is work out. I really do set aside an hour and a half to just go run and lift because I need to do that personally for me. I still answer calls and send texts while I work out, but just being physically engaged and being healthy is, is a very, very uh, important component of this because it wears and tears on you. Um, as I mentioned before, I went to bed at 4.30 last night, so I only got like three hours of sleep. 
So eating healthy and, and working out really does make a world of difference. But um, in terms of just getting in the zone, I mean, just telling yourself that you're capable of it and writing down bullet points of I've accomplished A, B, and C, and I've done this and I can do this again, sort of just like positive self-talk. But honestly, once you get into a routine, all that stuff sort of just sets itself or a non-routine, it just sets itself aside and you just go, it just happens. So I'd say if you want to do anything on a routine basis, definitely work out because that really does help a lot. No, I, I couldn't agree more. There's nothing routine. I think about baseball, especially now in a pandemic, yeah. I think you're putting out a fire every single day. Um, but on that, making a routine for yourself and your mental health is important. I think for me, I start every single morning by working out before I open my laptop and log on. Um, because if I don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to properly focus and give myself that hour or two to truly just be with myself and not my phone and not my laptop. Um, there really is no routine. You could think you're working a a miracle of a nine to five day. And next thing you know, you're on Zooms or on a plane till 4.30 the next morning like Matt was. So it just, it's, you have to make sure you find time for yourself and your mental health and taking care of your body because you can become run down and you can become restless. But I think just making sure too, that when in that time that you have for yourself, preparing yourself for your day. Like we had this panel today, so Matt and I prepared our questions in advance to talk to each other. So we didn't sit here and twiddle our thumbs. So I think preparedness in that time that you have for yourself, that one, two hours a day is really important. Um, and I can't stress that in your mental health enough, but that is all for today. And Matt, I can't thank you enough. Your answers, your insight, your advice. It was so valuable. I think everyone on the call was at, you know, asking such great questions. They're truly uh, amazed at what you do and they are encouraged. So I cannot thank you enough for all who took the time to join today. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day. Again, feel free to connect with us offline on the Violet Network. And we look forward to seeing you all in the industry soon. Thank yes, you. Thank you.